Not okay. everybody. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for joining us, um, everybody, and thank you, Solly. I'm really excited to see the launch of your book. Um, it's amazing. It's been great working with you for the past. Um, I don't even know how many months we've, we've or I've been involved for about three months. You've been working on this for much longer, um, but it's been uh, amazing to watch you so passionately work on this. Um, so what the session will be is a deep dive into some of the key themes of Sully's latest, latest book, The Solutionist, which I've got here. <laughs> Um, and then that will be followed by a short Q&A where you'll be free to ask her any questions you have about the book, as well as her journey as a solutionist. Um, I was going to say in the meantime, everyone should put their uh, names and where they're from um, and what they do in the chat. I'm not sure if that's working yet, but once it does start working, please feel free to do that. Um, and also, please, as, long, as we go on, just enter your questions to the Q&A straight away. There's no need to like wait until the end, we'll just get to them um, once we once I finish my chat with her. So um, don't worry about that. And to quickly introduce myself, I'm Aisha, a former copywriter at Futera turned marketing advocacy manager. And I'm also co-founder of an art platform called Yellowzine, which centralizes and supports the creativity of artists from the African, Caribbean and Asian diaspora within the UK. And I'm joined here by Solitaire, who, aside from being my boss, um, is also co-founder and chief solutionist of, of Futera and a second time author, soon to be fifth time author, from what I heard this morning, um, of her latest book called The Solutionists. Um, for those of you that don't know already, The Solutionist is a handbook to coach you through the steps, mindsets and strategies that will put your organization at the forefront and take personal ownership of sustainability solutions. And it features great people such as um, climate leaders, such as Cristiano Figueres, um, Kate Brandt, who's the sustainability officer at Google, um, author of Intersectional Environmentalist Leah Thomas, and Bill Gates. Um, so it's an amazing blueprint for all businesses looking to adapt to survive and to help solve the climate crisis. So yeah, let's just get straight into it. So sorry, I want to start from the beginning. Um, the beginning for me, I guess, which is um, for the past, since we've worked together, which has been about five years, you've talked about being a solutionist previously, but I think in the past two or three years, it's really become part of the company's ethos as a whole, and it's something that you've pushed forward um, quite a lot. It's been really great to see it grow as a term, but I would love you to just get a little bit um, more detail about what you, how you would describe a solutionist, what you think a solutionist is. Thank you so much, Aisha. And you're a solutionist. Um, <laughs> and by the way, she mentioned Yellow Zine. She's going to give a plug for my book. Let me give a massive plug for Yellow Zine. It's one of the only things which I actually read <laughs> when, it, um, when it arrives in my inbox. Um, so solutionists are, there's a dictionary definition, a solver of problems. And when we look around the world today in 2023, and in fact, over the last 20 years of my career, the need for solvers of problems are quite obvious. And uh, and there's other ways you could talk about it as an answer activist is one of the terms that I've used as a fixer of the future. But basically, solutionists are people who see a problem and want to solve it. Now, for many people on this call, that's going to be pretty obvious. Well, of course, when you see a problem, you want to solve it. That's not actually how everybody um, interacts with these issues of sustainability. Overwhelm, grief, challenge, ennui, frozenness in the face of problems is really, really common. So one of the reasons why I wrote The Solutionists is I have such a privilege of working every day here in Futella and with so many of the people who are here on the call, um, with people who are are creating answers, finding answers, growing answers. Um, and I wanted to make sure that everybody in business and beyond have an opportunity to think like that and to, you know, become part of the solution. I think it's great. You mentioned, um, like, I'm a solutionist, and I think people don't often associate themselves with being solutionists because it's not something that they're necessarily familiar with. Um, so with the people that you spoke to an array of people for your book and you interviewed um, a lot of solutionists across different sectors, was there a key learning or a key insight that you think was con consistent across all these people, um, like a key theme that you pulled out? 
I knew you were going to ask this question. Obviously, we haven't got all the questions agreed, but we did have a few. And obviously, in my book, I've talked about the five attributes that uh, solutionists have, all of which are learnable, all of which you can grow your own ability on. Um, but there's one that I talk about um, again and again and again, and I mentioned throughout the book, which is solutionists tend to be quite happy. Now, it's a weird thing to say as being an attribute of solutionists, but I think most of us realise that anxiety, our anxiety about things, our sense of overwhelm about things, often comes from an inability to do anything about them, a sense of uh, 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 low agency, a sense of a lack of power. And actually, as soon as you realise that you do have power and you can do something about the issues that we're facing, and I'm not saying that you're going to wave a magic wand or that these issues are easily solvable, they're not, but you can do something. You can take action. You do not have to be frozen in the headlights of horrors. You can actually stand up against them and try, and try to do something. It, it lifts the spirits, it raises the heart, it makes it so much easier to stare into the abyss if you actually are sort of building a bridge across it. So um, uh, I go into a lot of the skill sets, the mindsets, grit, flexibility, um, vision, a sense of soul, um, a sense of fun. But I think the one, the one thing that really struck me with the hundreds of interviews I did and the thousands of solutionists I've worked with over the last 20 years is there's a lot of laughter, um, which might surprise people who don't work on these issues every day. But when you're working on them, rather than worrying about them, it feels better. Um, um, you mentioned the mindset that it takes to um, be a solutionist and something that's consistent across all the solutionists that you've um, covered. And in the third chapter of the book, you talk about three key categories of like superpowers um, that differentiates the solutionists. And you say you refer to them as a three A's, which is architects, accelerators, and actioners. Could you briefly describe what each three thing is, each of the three are, and also why you think it's important to be able to categorize yourself and identify yourself within those? So this is a bit of an admission, really, but um, uh, I tend to be one of those people who are happy to try their hand at anything. I just jump in and I get it done. And what I've learned over the last 20 years is that's not a good idea because I am not good at everything. There are many things which I feel like I do excel in, but there's many things which I don't. And part of my journey as a solutionist has been realising that I need to surround myself with people who have got different skill sets different abil abilities different gifts to me and that I can also be part of them surrounding themselves with people who are different so I'm an architect um that, that's like I I prefer looking at problems from 300,000 feet from sort of you know uh international space station level I like to look at problems at I like to put esoteric issues together I like not to unpick and to be think about the biggest plan I can po possibly think about um I'm pretty good at it and I I tend to pitch those plans quite heavily and sometimes too heavily and I sometimes keep going <laughs> um but what I what I can really struggle with is um activating people and, and working with other teams um, and I can sometimes sort of become a bit defeated and or even worse move on from a great idea once it's out there in the world and not maintain it so that's um, architects I think we're brilliant I'm fully in the architect camp but there's also um, uh, areas where architects don't shine um, accelerators are a group which um, uh, over the years I've realized are absolutely necessary for me because it's not my skill set, which is team builders, um, folks who, who are all about the people, who mm -hmm. understand that nothing gets done without there being the right skill sets, the right culture, the right attitude, the right um, uh, 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 that people are looked after well, that people are developed, and that um, accelerators are often in sustainability, I think, can become overlooked 
um, uh, uh, because, you know, it tends to be a lot of academic type debate in sustainability, but actually the people, people, the mavens, the, the connectors, the, the human creators are the most uh, a crucial aspect in any team because they realise you can't, it, it's not just about the building, it's about the people who live in it. And then the actioners, uh, there are many actioners that we do about and elsewhere, people get things done who, if there is a plan, if there is a great team, they are going to be the ones who work and make it happen. Another word from this, completer finishers. Now, without actioners, nothing happens. It all becomes a big talking shop of folks getting together and um, spouting off about sustainability. And all of us have had that experience. We've all had the experience of being in a room full of architects getting really excited about ideas and then walking out of the room and nothing happening. That's what the actioners are all about. And the actioners um, are, are, are the ones who in every organisation are the ones who actually follow through on the plans, make sure that they happen and maintain them over time. But again, actioners can have challenges as well, as in if they don't have a good plan, if there isn't a clear vision, if there isn't a good architect plan for them to work to, They'll just keep doing stuff because doing the wrong thing is better than doing nothing. And so um, uh, actioners need to work with great architects to make sure that they're going in the right direction. So as you can see, if you're one of these groups, you probably will know you're one of it by the bad bit I just described. <laughs> why people tend to be able to identify with the groups by um, by some of their Achilles heels um, slightly more than um by the massive gifts. But you know, all of us tend to have one type that we are probably slightly more like, another type that perhaps we would, you know, uh, uh, sometimes work with a type that perhaps we're not like at all. And the reason why I gave these typologies is not to put people in boxes, but to actually remind us to work with people who are different to us, to work with people who've got complementary skills and amazing abilities that we don't have. Because there isn't one solution, there's not one single solutionist that I met who had all the answers. The question I'm going to ask you now um, is a bit more personal as to do with my personal experience in the industry. And as a black female migrant um, Muslim woman that works in the sustainability industry, which is a very heavily white male dominated field, I often feel othered and often feel some imposter syndrome and that my needs or my experiences aren't necessarily met or related to. And in your chapter, um, your signal boost in chapter, you, you talked about it being a white dominated industry. Um, and obviously with this power and the privilege that these people have, they still need to, we can't just be like, hey, you're white, man, you can't do this. Um, they still need to be able to empower others and kind of use their privilege for good. So. With you having 20 years of experience, experience in the industry, is there any advice that you would give to anyone, probably named John, um, that you would like to that you would like to share with them in order to make a real meaningful and universal impact within the environmental field? Firstly, thank you, Aisha, for being prepared to share that on a on a big webinar. Um, the reason that people are seeing why we joked about the name John is that there are more people called John running FTSE 500 companies than there are women or people of colour. So in my book, I talk about the fact that if I'm writing for a business audience, I need to recognise the demographics of the business audience. And someone's probably more likely to be called John in my book if they're picking it up at a travel stop or in a business section of a bookshop than anything else. It's, it's a really fucking awful problem. It, the, our movement, the sustainability movement, from the outside looks institutionally racist. Maybe it is institutionally racist. It's been uh, bemoaned upon the fact that the lack of diversity in sustainability in CSR um, for many years, and yet it's getting better. To so very, I want to say that there are many regrets that I have over the years of how I could have been a better ally and changed it. Uh, one of the reasons why I wrote the Signal Boost chapter is in the Signal Boost chapter, it's a book about other people's books because uh, it's really important that all of us call out the challenges, 
all of us call out the solutionists that there are around the world, um, the global solutionists, um, but maybe not speak for them um, and um, recommend and uplift voices in every single book. In like, as in, if there's only one reason to buy my book, buy it to get the list of all these other books um, uh, that you might want to read. So uh, if if you are one of the many, many, many willing, um, open-minded people in sustainability who are not happy with the way in which this movement or indeed business or indeed society itself is functioning, from my own experience of being a white middle-aged woman, um, listen, that's it, listen. There's so much advice out there. There's so much insight. There are so many solutions. Like I talk in the book about uh, indigenous solutions um, and around how we've got massive conferences, millions of dollars, um, chairs of sustainability are being endowed at the biggest universities um, with a great deal of money, all about trying to work out how society can function, how business can function in harmony with nature, which, of course, we already know how to do that. Human beings have been doing that for generations. We just actually need to listen without appropriation and, and lifting up the voices. So, yeah, it's um, I don't I thought about just weaving that conversation through the book in a natural way. And I tried to do that. And then I realized that isn't good enough. We're not yet at the point in the world where you can just weave intersectionality through and hope people pick it up. You still got to call it out, um, draw attention and um, raise voice. Thank you. That was a beautiful answer. Um, and I think that it was really important that that chapter was in there. Um, and I think I think I appreciate that you didn't shy away from putting that in there. I think often um, people from lesser marginalized communities feel like they don't, they're not able to speak on the issue at all or not able to speak on exclusion at all. Um, so I think that it's, um, you set a great example by just making a statement and saying something and rather than just stay inside stay inside and hope that it solves itself by hoping for the best i just realized that if you'd like to answer that question as well this is a platform to do so on is there anything that you would recommend to people um uh, uh listening in terms of this issue which is so central to sustainability um i think that one of my first thoughts is passing the mic, which is something that um, we do a lot here at Futera and we do a lot personally, is recognizing the space that you're taking up um, and the platform that you have. And if that space could go to somebody else that's more fitting for that space that isn't that doesn't fit your description, just pass the mic to that person because there there are hundreds of, if not thousands, of climate activists that are white men. Um, and yes, it's great. It's great for a white man to, to use his voice, or it's great for any person of privilege to use their voice in support. But also, along with that, you should stretch out your hands to actually bring, bring in somebody who knows what they're talking about, who has that lived experience, to, to, to tell their own stories and share their own narratives. Um, so that the change comes um, from an authentic place and a place that's been lived. I think uh, yeah. everyone listening can realise why I'm putting quite a lot of pressure on Aisha to write her book. <laughs> so that we can do this the other way around. I don't know what you want me to write. <laughs> In like three years, I'm going to be interviewing her for her book. Just saying. We'll see. <laughs> Um, so that was my last question before I go to um, Q&A. We've got loads of questions coming in already. Um, where should I start? Um, okay, so we've got a question here that says, Solly, I'd love to hear your perspective on how to navigate the overwhelming amount of work to be done without burning out. As a solutionist, how can we embrace action and stay focused while staying positive? That's such a great question. Um, and one of the reasons why it's such a great question is that I suck at that really badly. So in the book, I, there's a whole chapter about joy and about self-care and about being able to keep going in the face of all of this. And because I knew a lot of people who knew me would read the book, I had, I had to write a section 
that basically uh, uh, acknowledge the fact that I am terrible at this. Um, my family will tell you I I don't I I I really really struggle to stop. Um, but there was one interview that I did um, for the book which shook me quite hard actually, which was Lily Cole. Uh, many of you will know Lily is an uh, actress. She's a model. She's also an activist um, uh, and an author herself. And when I was and when I interviewed her, she was actually on her way to a funeral, and was feeling quite vulnerable um, about her own feelings about the movement. Um, uh, uh, the person who she was going to celebrate the life of had been an uh, environmental listener and a change maker himself. Um, and she said something to me that, that stayed with me. In fact, I might write it on a series of post-its uh, above my bed, which is, um, what's the point of trying to save life on Earth if you're not having one? And I, we went a little bit deeper in terms of how so often we uh, talk about rest and self-care as if it was in service of making us a better change maker. Even today, um, I was talking about going on holiday and about maybe I'll do a bit of work on it. And uh, one of my colleagues, Karen, said, yeah, but you need a break to make you a better change maker. And I realized that we even think about our rest as being to make us better change makers, or I've got to eat well because it will give me more energy, or you know, I, I'm going to take an evening off because I'll come back fresher. And um, what that conversation with Lily convinced me of is we're allowed to rest, turn off, you know, watch trashy TV, watch a box set, spend time with our family, go for a walk, not because it's going to make us a better change maker. Maybe it'll even make us a worse change maker. We're allowed to do so because we're a human being and that that is part of the human experience. So um, in the book, there's a whole list of things that you can do. There's a whole, we did, um, in fact, actually some of the people on the call here, um, uh, uh, David Grayson, uh, 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 Chris Coulter and Mark Lee and I did a survey of, um, of solutionists and, and change makers and asked them all the things they do. And we've got all of that long list um, in, the, in the book. But the main thing that I can say, and in my experience, the thing that's a, that solutionists need most is permission. You already know how to rest. You already know how to turn off. You already know how, how you need to uh, regenerate. What you don't have is permission to do so. So I just keep reminding yourself of Li Lily's words, which is what's the point of trying to save life on earth if you're not having one? Yeah, you need to learn how to rest, Sonny. <laughs> I should know better than most how much I suck at that. I'm working on it. Like uh, when I wrote the art, when I wrote the the chapter, um, uh, I was writing it as much for myself as I was for anybody else. Um, I've got a question here from Robert Parry, and it reads: Our current crisis is the result of a series of interlocked legacy systems that have been with us for decades or even hundreds of years. This generation is presented with the question: Will we, humanity, evolve or die? Evolving means reimagining most of the legacy systems based on new, some would say ancient mindsets. In your view, what's the most expedient work with existing systems or what's the most expedient work with existing systems or ditch them and start again? This is a massive question. <laughs> like, like this is, deserves a whole webinar of itself. Um, uh, the answer for me is uh, whichever one of those you're best at. So in sustainability, we spend a lot of time telling each other how to make change. Um, that we have, you know, I have friends who believe the only way to change the world is through activism. I've got friends who believe the only way to change the world is through entrepreneurialism. I've got people who believe that we've literally got to pull down governments and, and transform our systems. And we've got other people who think we can do it all through, through uh, status and storytelling. Um, what I've come to learn is that none of us know which one of those answers is going to work. We might have very strong beliefs, which ones we think will work, but neither of us know. And so what you should do is you should work on the best that you're best at. I've tried to do activism. I did a lot of it when I was younger. I'm too old and my knees hurt. I am actually much better at cajoling and convincing and bullying <laughs> large organizations into doing things instead however somebody else would hate doing that and would be so much better at being an entrepreneur I suspect that over time human beings tend to live in punctuated equilibrium 
where everything's the same. Everything changes so quickly, then everything's the same, then everything changes so quickly. I suspect we will get quite a big transformation of our systems. I suspect that we will root out some of the colonialism, some of the uh, uh, growth uh, GDP mindset. I think that we will change quite fundamentally um, uh, how our systems work. And there will be another system that will feel completely normal and we'll never be able to imagine it um, uh, beforehand. So uh, one of the best bits about punctuated equilibrium, which is how um, I, work, I talk in the book about how change happens and how, how change doesn't happen like this. It happens like this exponentially in terms of society. And there's lots of evidence to show that is that it means we've still got time, because if you track back the last 20 years, there's been nowhere near enough change for where we need to be today. But if you could imagine exponential change over the next five to 10 years, we can get there. Um, we've got so many questions. Uh, I'm going to go for what is your opinion on green growth versus degrowth? Green growth, degrowth, uh, regrowth, GDP. Um, uh, there's a section in the book called The Solutions Economy. In the solutions economy, I refer to some amazing um, uh, economists. I've got Kate Woolworth in there, Mariana Vazakutu. Um, uh, I did a great interview with Rebecca Henderson. Hmm, just realised they're all women. Uh, about the different economic models that, that we could have, about whether you know uh, growth is cancer, etc. Within the period of time that we've got, within the next eight years, in terms of radical change within systemology, I suspect that will happen within the systems we've currently got. Um, within, should we say, kind of uh, a, a transforming capitalism, because we're already seeing that happen, particularly with renewable energy, which is now cheaper than an, uh, 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 um, oil and gas energy. If, however, we want to get to a sustainable system rather than just save ourselves from climate change, I think we are going to have to radically reimagine our economic systems. Again, thankfully, that has happened many times before, and human beings have lived in many different systems around the world. The one thing which I always needs to be remembered, though, is that we're human beings. So another article I've written that's not in the book about apes versus angels. I, um, I believe in evolution. I believe that we're nothing other than animals. There's no difference between us and any other life on Earth. But that means we're also nothing more than animals. We're driven by status. We're driven by uh, social hierarchy. We're driven by social proof. We're a, a social animal who works with people around us. And um, we're not angels who are able to somehow um, only appeal to our better values. And so whatever system we end up working with, whether it is the current capitalist system or something radically different, it's got to be one within which human beings can be humans. This question is very linked to what you said earlier about trying to force me to write a book. Um, and it says, for everyone thinking about writing, I would love for you to share with the women in the audience what you always share with me about writing a book also. Um, but for anyone thinking about writing a book, can you share any techniques or writing strategies and how have they helped you achieve your creative vision? And what did you learn or discover about yourself whilst writing this book? So um, everybody, who wants to have a long tail of their influence on the world needs to write books. The reason why you need to write books is because when you're 80, it's a job title you'll still have. The job title you have at the moment, you won't always have. The former CEO or the former leader or the former so-and-so only lasts about two or three years after you've no longer got that job. But when you're 80, the author of, when I'm 80, people can, if I'm lucky enough to live that long, people can invite me onto a panel as author of The Solutionists. And it's still a live existing job title. So if you want to have a long influence on the world, write books. And I've had many wonderful men uh, mentors, people like John Alkington, who have been encouraging me for years to write books. And I hadn't realized that's what they meant. <laughs> Which is, it's, it's part of the way to have a... Factor degree, factor 10, factor 50, bigger influence in the world and a bigger voice in the world than you ever had before. It's not easy to write a book. It's also not as hard as people make out. You write every day, you write emails, you write reports. All of us are writing, maybe you even write articles. All of us are writing all the time. It just means uh, writing slightly more uh, about one thing than you've written before. Although you have easily written 60,000 words, you probably write. 100, 10, 50, 100 books over in a year in terms of the amount of words that you write. This is just writing uh, 60 to 80,000 on one topic. So don't think about writing a book. Think about writing a book proposal. 
what's something you want to write about and can you write chapter outlines and then think about writing a chapter at a time which is 3,000 words so that's how you write the book you write it 3,000 words at a time and you try not to think about the overall word count the second part of the question was what did you learn about yourself when you're writing this book oh what I learned about myself is that uh, I far prefer working with others than on my own it's quite lonely writing a book it's interesting it's entirely you it's all your ideas you get to um uh, set it out in your own voice um but it's also that means it's all about you and it's all in your own voice and you don't get to uh, uh um, do things collaboratively so that's one of the big things that I learned about myself I also learned that I am far happier releasing things into the world under Futera's name which is all of us together than I am under mine I'm very I, I find the fact that my name is written on this quite um anxiety inducing so um i learned i have got as much imposter syndrome as anybody else yeah um i think i didn't really know that about you actually until this book and the panic that ensued when you had to self-promote and i said sorry chill out <laughs> she actually turned me off she told me just to stop just dial the imposter syndrome down get over it it's about it's like okay thanks so much. You are right. um, we've got a question here it says sustainability is usually thought of as energy climate waste etc what are your thoughts on the parallel biodiversity crisis it seems to me that the same approaches ought to work to address that but that's not often focused on yet so for many of us on this call who have been in sustainability for a long time since the 90s um when we came into sustainability the environmental issues were primarily about biodiversity and nature so many of us um, were drawn to working on this topic because of relationships with nature, because of um, hearing about extinction and about, um, uh, about the loss of nature. That's actually where lots of people start. And then we find about, about climate change, this sort of enormous world eating monster that is going to that's going to you know and it's also got the the benefit of being new something which perhaps those of us who are older didn't know about when we were children which kind of can eclipse all of the other issues climate change and biodiversity crisis are the same crisis they are the same thing they have the same causes and in many ways they have the same solutions so solving one solves the other if you're smart about it so um uh in the work that we do in Futero, i said we probably work equally on the nature crisis as we do on the climate crisis over the years, sometimes slightly more on one, sometimes slightly, slightly more on the other. But if we solve climate change whilst keeping the extinction uh, rate we've got at the moment, we're still screwed. Um, and if we solve the extinction rate we've got at the moment, if we manage to solve that down, it will probably be by solving climate change. Speaking of being screwed, um, the IPCC report came out um, a few weeks last week, I think. Um, and there was a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of climate anxiety in the world already. And it wasn't necessarily stuff we didn't know before, but it was a reminder that we are a bit screwed. Um, so how do you, I've got a question here that says, how do you stay optimistic um, that we'll make the change that we need to make? So um, I found this, the, the synthesis report that came out just a couple of weeks ago, which was the sort of short version, it's still really, really long, the short version of the AR6 report that came, the working group AR6 report that came out um, early last year, and in fact the whole AR6 report, all three of the working groups that came out last year, I found the synthesis report super optimistic actually not just the content because the content is as scary and forthright as it always is but how the UN decided to frame it and in fact how the, the scientists decided to frame it they, they framed this report not as a clarion call for the end of the world not as our last warning they they prefer it as the plan this is the plan and that's where we need to be putting our efforts now the scientists will continue to tell us clearly and in detail how bad things have got. But one of the things which I talk about in the solutionists is look at the problem for just long enough to start coming up with solutions. Because putting your effort, your heart, your emotions into the problem doesn't do anything. You've got to look at it, recognize it, see it squarely in the eyes, don't dismiss it, don't in any way downplay it, but then fucking do something about it it and so um uh one other thing which i thought was really interesting about the report is when i first started working in sustainability when you're around some of the earlier cops 
um, the IPCC had us on track for five degrees of, wealth, of warming, um, five degrees. That is no longer what we're on track for within the current framework and all things being equal and if there isn't feedback effects, et cetera. So one of the things which is so rarely spoken about is the progress we've already made. And I think the reason why people don't talk about it is they're worried that if we talk about progress, if we talk about what's been achieved, somehow everyone will go, oh, great, it's all sorted out. That's not how human beings work. What we need to show is that this is winnable, that we can make a difference, that impacts have been made. And of course, they're inadequate and of course, they were nowhere near enough, but they're not completely wasted. That everything which we've done has had an impact and we have managed to turn the dial from a likely five degrees worth of warming down to I think that the 1.5 is now in question. But that's still a massive change in terms of what we were on track for when I first started working in this movement. So look at the problem for just long enough to come up with a solution and then put all your heart, soul and energy into acting on the solution. It's so one other little trick, though which is stop waiting for instant gratification. Stop waiting for everything which you do on sustainability to show up in science. It's not how climate change works. I'm pushing 50. Some people on the call know exactly how old I am. Um, in my remaining lifetime, I'm not going to see the impact of what I've done. I'm not going to see whether what I have done has managed to turn the dial on climate change or not. By the time I'm 70 or 80, we probably will be at the worst of the climate change impacts. So I have to keep working. I have to keep optimistic. I have to keep uh, uh, committed to this issue and working on it without there being any sense that I'm going to get personal gratification and feedback on whether what I've done has made a difference. So suck it up, keep working on it, keep making a difference for an outcome you'll never see, because that's how people all through history have made change. The first suffragettes, they never got to vote. The civil rights leaders never saw the first black president. You don't do this work in order for you to get to reap the rewards. You do it so that future generations do. Um, I think Sorry, really that was that was that was a bit of a stump speech. Oh yeah, that was like a speech. <laughs> wow. Okay. I feel, but I feel really strongly about it. People get so so dissatisfied and sometimes despairing and sometimes a bit bitter because they feel like they're not making a difference. And it's like going, no, that's just that's a bit selfish. You're just expecting the world to tell you that what you you do matters. It's not how these things work. You do it anyway because it's the right thing to do. So generally speaking, would you say that that's like a key barrier to stop some of the solutionists, some of the solutions that we see happening? Or so there's a question here that's, that asks, is it a lack of solutions or a lack of willingness to make change you think is plaguing us? So uh, the Royal Society in London, that august uh, scientific body, which everyone from Marie Curie um, uh, uh, to uh, Alec Einstein remembers of, they've done a number of analysis, as have the IPCC, to say we actually have all the solutions that we need. You know, even, even with the state of battery storage, even with the state of um, uh, renewable sufficiency, even with, this, with how much the circular economy leaks, we could get that even just with the technologies and solutions that we have now. We're going to get better ones. People are going to invent even most amazing ones. But there's nothing in the science that says we can't solve this. So um, it's not a lack of solutions. It's a lack of solutionists. We need so many more people to feel that they can actually make a difference and be part of the answer. Not just hundreds or thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions. We need billions. We need humanity to feel that this is a fight that we can win. So we've got the solutions that we need to we'll get even better, even more amazing ones. But scientifically, we've got the solutions that we need to solve climate change right now. We have everything which we need. We just need more people working to do so. Mm -hmm. So we're almost at time. So I'm just going to ask two more questions. From I was going to ask my own. I'll, I'll, I'll try to answer them much faster. Sorry, it's too interesting. People <laughs> asking faster. such good questions. <laughs> um, so one question that ties into what you just said is how do we create more solutions? Read the book. How do you create more solutionists? Um, so yes, read the book. Uh, recommend it to your friends. Share it online. So this is my copy with all of the notes um, in it. Uh, <laughs> uh, 
talk about Dr. Catherine Hayhoe, who many of you know, one of our um, best climate scientists, said the most important thing you can do about climate change is talk about it. I would say one of the most important ways you can recruit solutionists is talk about being a solutionist. Talk about why you do this. Talk about the what you do. Invite other people to do so. Dismantle barriers to people who are underrepresented in sustainability to come into this group. So the, the more we talk about what we get out of doing this, that we feel happy, that we feel um, uh, empowered, that we feel like we're making a difference, that uh, it's fun, that it's a great community, that it's really supportive, that you get a sense of belonging, all these benefits from being a solutionist, talk about that more and people will want to come and play. Mm -hmm. Um, and then my last question, which is going to be a little bit kind of long, maybe, um, is what is your origin story and when did you first start thinking about the environment and how has it become your life's work? Round that up in one minute. <laughs> so um, this is a bit of a difficult one to answer because I just noticed my mum is on the school. <laughs> so, you know, mum, if you want to write, it's my book launch, so my mum is here. Um, if you want to write what my origin story is, feel free to do so. So um, in my previous book, The Happy Hero, I talk about it in detail. In this book, I talk about it a bit. Um, uh, as my family often teases me about, the accent is a bit fake because I actually grew up at a council estate in um, Bedfordshire. Um, I saw firsthand how communities, particularly working class communities, um, are treated in terms of the environment, how often that social poverty issues um, intersect with uh, poor environmental um, uh, experiences. I was dyslexic. Um, thanks, Mum, for calling me so much. <laughs> and Dad's on as well. Dad. Um, uh, and it, around the time when I first started to get into campaigning which was when I was 13 is also around the time when I started to feel a sense of self-worth and the fact that maybe I could be more than a council estate girl I could be more than you know getting a job in the local shop if I was lucky and so that's one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about people becoming a solutionist is because the world needs it but you need it um, my life from trying to make a difference in the world is so much different to the life which perhaps I was destined um, to live when I was younger. Um, working in this field has changed me and I think my family would say it's changed our family as well. So um, my origin story is experiencing exclusion, experiencing poverty, experiencing environmental degradation, experiencing people fly tipping in our garden because, you know, you do that on the council estate, um, deciding to do something about it and realizing that trying to make a difference in the world radically made a difference to me. So I talk about the origin story of quite a lot of change makers in the book. Some people had childhood experiences like I did, some people had life changing experiences, like one of the CEOs I spoke to had meningitis, he almost died. And when he sort of awoke from that and decided to change the world, and loads of people come to becoming a solutionist just by reading books, by coming onto webinars like this, by just deciding that they're going to be. So you don't have to have a particularly amazing origin story to become a solutionist. You just have to read a book, okay. preferably the solutionists. Um, so that leads me to, so uh, we've reached the end of our webinar. There are some questions that I can answer, but guess where you can find the answers? In the solution. <laughs> well, actually, well, I'm sure we'll be able to keep a copy of all the questions that have been asked. And over the coming days on LinkedIn and Twitter, um, I'll try to answer them uh, as we go through, because I can see there's some amazing ones on there. And some of them have really made me think. So I'd love to be able to answer all of them over the kind of coming few days. Yeah, and if you haven't got, got the book already, it's available on Amazon and Waterstones and the bookstore and Barnes and Noble and any good bookstore. Sure. There's there's a, a website called um, bookshop.org, actually, which is a, a non-profit um, uh, bookshop, which I would thoroughly recommend.
Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Solly. It's been great talking to you. And you are an inspiration to me. You continue to be. You have been for the past five years, and it's an honor to work with you. And I'll see you over there because she's just in the next room. Let's go get a cup of tea. Everyone. <laughs> Thanks so much, Aisha. I really, really appreciate you hosting this. It's a big deal. And thank you to everybody that I interviewed in the book. Thank you to all the Puterans who were acknowledged in the book for the support that they've given over the year. And I just, um, I feel a bit emotional about this. But thank you to every single person on this call and elsewhere who are working to make a difference. Um, there's a lot of solutions out there. It's not easy all the time. I do talk about that in the book as well. But you are making a difference. And I'm immensely grateful to be part of a community that's doing so. Thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of your Monday. Thank you. Bye.